Okay, got it. So, so um, you can see it okay, everything. Uh, so, the YouTube live has been uh, okay. So, uh, hello and welcome to many of the where we uh, aim to bring you the most cutting edge information from Mexico. Uh, just a Yeah. Hello and welcome to my Newsweek conference where we aim to bring you the most cutting information from medicine's global leaders. I'm Rabha Bhuned and I'll be your host today. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge the incredible team that helps uh, to make these events a reality. Our founders are two internationally recognized uh, researchers, Dr. Jan Kiefman and Dr. Chandler Park. Our chairs include Dr. Park and Dr. Wheatman. Our associate directors include Madhuri, Uskan and Gayatri. Our associate managers include Alexandra, William, Ahmed, and Helena. Our educational committee includes Sean, Shubha, Harshal, Reda, uh, Shri Harshita, Soumya, Imad, Shrivika, and myself. So we also want to thank our partners, Vumedi, and the National Society of High School Scholars, uh, and I3 Health. Uh, it is also a CME, NCBD, CP accredited organization with the mission of enhancing the proficiency of the multidisciplinary team by providing evidence-based activities that address unmet uh, educational needs for the healthcare team. So Oncology Data Advisor is I3 Health's new website that delivers up-to-date, clinically relevant content, interviews, and commentary from key opinion leaders in oncology. The moderator for today's event is Jenna. And now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Monica Gandhi. She is an internationally recognized leader and researcher in infectious diseases. She has held numerous national leadership positions, including Professor of uh, Medicine and Associate Chief in the Division of HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a recipient of multiple national awards and honors, including the James Hormel Community Spirits Award uh, from the Shanti Project for Public Service in COVID-19 and HIV. She has published more than uh, 250 peer-reviewed articles on HIV and other infectious diseases. And she has also authored a book on COVID-19 for Mayo Clinic Press called Endemic, a post-pandemic clinic. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Monica Gandhi. The floor is yours, Dr. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to kind of go over everything HIV in a relatively short period of time and then take your questions because we're at a really uh, crux in a lot of what's happening in HIV. So we'll actually talk about the history. I think it's important to always start with the history of an infectious disease. We'll then talk about the state of the pandemic in the world and the United States at the moment. Uh, we'll talk about where we are, what are the innovations in HIV treatment at this point, HIV prevention, and end with just a comment on HIV vaccines and cure in 2023. So when we talk about the history you know, it's important because we're in coming off another pandemic is to think about what is happening in the world that, that sets us up for pandemics, sets us up for new infectious diseases. And not only is there climate change, but really what you'll find out when I talk about the HIV epidemic is our interaction with animals can be very problematic. And this is our, zo our zoonoses is really when a microbe jumps from a non-human into a human host. Um, and we'll talk about zoonoses in, in the context of HIV. We also have changed our agricultural practices, with, which can attract new pests. We encroach on animal habitats, habitats. 
Our urbanization means that diseases spread very quickly and jet travel, ships, everything is made, things happen so quickly in infectious diseases. So what happened in HIV? Because HIV has been a tragedy that has now gone on for longer than 40 years. What was the etiology of HIV? Well, first we have to remember what kind of virus HIV is. And HIV is what's called a retrovirus. What that means is its genetic material starts as RNA and it trans it, it um confer it becomes essentially DNA in the human host and then integrates itself into the human chromosome. And the specific type of retrovirus that HIV, sometimes people refer to it as a lentivirus with the lenta prefix meaning slow. There's a very slow progression from getting the infection to actually getting becoming ill. And so we know in a way where this came from because primates, other primate species beyond humans all live with different retroviruses. There's a number of simian immunodeficiency viruses that are throughout the primate world. And because of this, it means that somehow um, we had an entrance from the simian world from primates into humans. And the question is, where did that happen? How did that happen? And when did that happen? Well, before we get to those questions, we have to remember that there's two major types of HIV. There's HIV-1 and there's HIV-2. HIV-1 causes the majority of HIV infections around the world. Actually, specifically, Group M is the pandemic strain. And HIV-1 is most close, closely related to the SIV strain in the chimpanzee species. So we know it must have come in from chimpanzees. Then what about HIV-2? That's restricted to West Africa and countries that colonized West Africa, like France, like Portugal, and then, and then places that those countries colonized. So HIV-2 would be found, for example, in Goa, um, where Portugal had colonized. And that SIV strain that HIV-2 is most closely related to is from the Sudi Mangabe. So the first theory, how HIV entered human populations was propounded in a book by a journalist named Edward Hooper. And Edward Hooper wrote this book and published it in 1999. And his idea was that it had something to do with the mass polio vaccination campaign because Sabin had developed the oral polio vaccine, Salk had developed, sorry, Salk had developed the oral polio vaccine, Sabin had developed the inactivated polio vaccine. And essentially there was competition between Sabin and another scientist named Hilary Kaprowski, who are competing for which vaccine worked best, the oral polio vaccine, Sabin's or Kaprowski's. Actually, uh, Hilary Kaprowski was told by the NIH in 1957 in a meeting, your vaccine's not as effective. We are not going with this. We're going to go with the Sabin vaccine. But actually, Kaprowski and his team did distribute about 1 million vaccine doses in what was called, formerly called the Belgian Congo. And what Edward Hooper postulates, it was that mass vaccination campaign that led to the entrance of HIV into human populations because it was grown in primate cells. Now, this is actually not the real reason it entered human populations. In fact, it was the wrong primate. It was African green monkeys. Um, those were the primate cells that were used. The timing didn't work out. And so he was officially apologized to, but that was the first theory that came out. So what is the real way that HIV entered human populations? Likely the crossover event is a practice called the bushmeat trade. And the bushmeat trade is the process essentially of killing, slaughtering, and eating primates for food. So again, that interference with animals, especially animals that are closely related to us, led to the entrance of HIV into human populations. And in fact, hunters that, that are actually bushmeat trade hunters have a number of different simian immunodeficiency viruses in their genomes, but one virus has to be sexually transmitted in an efficient way between human to human to become the strain that takes off into humans. And that clearly happened with HIV-1 and HIV-2 from two different simian strains. So about when did it get to us? Well, the problem about questioning when it got to us is that we would have to have blood specimens or tissue specimens that were stored for long periods of time because HIV enters through a cell receptor called CD4 and bones and hair that are contained, for example, in burial, burial sites 
do not actually have tissues that are left to see if HIV was in the human population. So we needed blood samples. So this was a paper that was published in Science in the year 2000 that thought that maybe they had figured out when HIV had entered human populations because there were 1,213 plasma specimens found at the University of Washington that had been collected in what was called Zaire at the time in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And one of those 1,213 plasma specimens that were stored in a freezer at the University of Washington had HIV in it. So these scientists did phylogenetic analysis which is really look at the difference between that, what was called Zyre 59 and the simian immunodeficiency virus and the currently circulating human virus, did genetic analysis and figured out that HIV entered humans around 1930. That was the predominant theory until this Nature paper was published in 2008 by Michael Warby. And what this Nature paper did is that they found another specimen. They found a lymph node from a female who had died of lymphoma in Kinshasa and they found that HIV was in that specimen. That particular specimen's HIV virus was called DRC60. They looked at the difference between Zyre 59, did another phylogenetic analysis, and determined that HIV probably entered human populations around the turn of the 20th century, around 1908, somewhere between 1884 and 1924. And that is actually the current prevailing hypothesis and idea when HIV came into human populations. Now you'll ask the question, why did we only start thinking about HIV in 1980, 1990s? Why was it first described in the early 80s when we've had it around since the early 1900s? That was likely, and this is a picture from that same nature paper by Dr. Warby, that was likely because the cities were very small in Western Africa at the time. Actually, cities were less than 10,000 people. They were not set up for the conditions of spread of a new sexually transmitted virus. But with colonialism, with the rise in city populations, with the establishment of different trades, with the establishment as well of the sex trade, essentially the conditions were set up for spread. And by the mid 1900s, Kinshasa was over 100,000 people. And by the later half of the century, there were large cities and conditions that were starting to spread the virus in West Africa. And then the virus had to come over from West Africa to East Africa. And there the conditions were really set up for spread in the late 1970s, early 1980s, because there was low status of women. There were low rates of circumcision among men, which is a protective factor for HIV infection. There was a big sex trade. There were lots of truck drivers going here and forth. And basically by 1986, 85% of sex workers in Nairobi, Kenya, were infected with HIV. And then it came down to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and other countries in the South. This was the map of the world of HIV in 1985. You can see it concentrating in West, coming over to East Africa. By 1995, it was really a very prevalent infection in mainly all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And then by 2005, with the breakdown of the former Soviet Union, there was spread in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc that really had to do with people who inject drugs um, and the opiate trade there. And now this is the current status of the pandemic in as of the end of the year 2022. A total of 39 million people are living with HIV worldwide. It's still most prevalent in East and Southern Africa with 20.8 of the infections in that region. And you can see the prevalence around the world. Now, to this latest update by UNAIDS, which is our main um, AIDS epidemiology organization, was provided in July of 2023. That's when we got our latest statistics, so just a month ago. But the year before, UNAIDS had warned that we were getting into a destabilization of our progress with HIV um, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, in 2021, we saw a rate of new infections that we thought we would be much lower than this, 1.5 million new infections, 650,000 deaths in 2021 from AIDS, and 40.3 million people have died of AIDS since the beginning of the epidemic, and only 75% of adults had access to antiretroviral uh, therapy and 52% of children by 2021. Those statistics had improved 
slightly by the uh, latest update a month ago, as of the end of 2022, that the number of new infections in 2022 were 1 1.3 instead of 1.5 the year before. The number of deaths due to AIDS in the year of 2022 was 630,000 around the world. And again, we're living with the highest number of infections that we've ever seen worldwide at 39 million. However, we are not where we thought we would be with HIV infection as of this year coming into 2024. We thought we'd be well over, under 500,000 new infections around the world. And as I told you, we're at 1.3 million. So there's clearly been destabilization and setbacks in the HIV response during COVID-19 and also somewhat of a lack of political will to work on what we need to do to end the HIV epidemic. There are two types of epidemiology that are described for HIV. There's one what's called generalized epidemics, and then there are one that in different countries, they're specialized. And what I mean by that is, for example, in the United States, HIV is concentrated mainly in key populations. However, in the main region where HIV is at its highest prevalence, about half of the infections are in the general population and about half of the infections are in what we call these key populations. These key populations include people who inject drugs, gay men, other men who have sex with men, transgender women, commercial sex workers, and clients of commercial sex workers. And unfortunately, it's these key populations in many regions of the world that are the most ignored. There's a lot of stigma against these populations. There's new backlash and anti-homosexuality laws that are being established. For example, one recently passed in Uganda that was very, very difficult. And because of that, there's a lot of stigma to try to control the epidemic in these key populations. Let's turn to the United States for a moment because uh, the United States have, has also had destabilization in its HIV response. The first case reports out of, of AIDS at all uh, that were ever described were first described in the US in June of 1981. These were these terrible infections that were being described in mainly young gay men in New York, Philadelphia, Miami, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And these two series of case reports, one published in June 5th and then July 4th in 1981, established these what was the pattern of AIDS that we were seeing around the world, which were really severe infections that we had mainly not seen, except in the case of severe immunodeficiency with organ transplants and other immunodeficiencies before the advent of this virus. San Francisco, where I work, was the epicenter of the epidemic in the early 1980s in the United States. And that 1984, the San Francisco Chronicle called um, that the year of the plague in the city of San Francisco. Of those 270 case series that I just told you about on June 5th and July 4th, um, out of 270 men, 121 had died over several years, meaning this was the fatality rate of HIV very soon after you develop severe immunodeficiency. It was a very highly fatal illness. And unfortunately, until we got medications, there was very little that we could do about it. The 1982, what the CDC had labeled gay-related immunodeficiency virus was thankfully relabeled AIDS by the CDC. 1983 was the first time a gay couple ever appeared on a major US magazine. This is Bobby Campbell and his husband, Bobby Hilliard. And um, unfortunately, Bobby Campbell died the next year. Our clinic that I am the medical director for called Ward 86 opened its doors in 1983. And 1984 bathhouses in San Francisco and New York were closed as an attempt to stim still the virus. And the first commercial ELISA was approved in 1985. This is a floor map of our clinic that I direct, 1980, uh, this is the Ward 86 clinic. And the reason I show it is because we tried to actually establish a one-stop model of care where everything would be done in the face of one clinic, chemotherapy, infusions, other treatments, psychiatric care, social work services, phlebotomy services, everything on site. And that became a national and international model of care um, for the country and for the globe where all care was managed in one setting for people living with HIV. And I think that has become a model in PEPFAR and other international AIDS programs. 
Um, I will uh, say that there was a lot of mixed messaging about the virus at the beginning of the pandemic. One major US magazine saying that you can only catch it from anal sex, which was not at all true. One magazine saying that everyone was equally at risk, which was also not at true. A lot of stigma accompanied this virus. A movie star named Rock Hudson came out and told us that he had this virus. Um, but there was a lot of stigma around it and a little boy who had acquired HIV from hemophilia and transfusions as a result named Brian White was not allowed to go inside his school. There was a lot of questioning about how it was caught. It really is a sexually transmitted virus or parenterally transmitted through blood, through blood transfusions, through people who inject drugs and through perinatal transmission but really it is not casually um, conducted. And there was a lot of mourning and grief and a lot of um, sadness before we got the antiretroviral therapies. This was um, a quilt project that was established to mourn the loss of people who had died of AIDS. And in 1987, this was the AIDS quilt laid across the Washington Mall. There were various programs established to combat AIDS uh, over the last 30 years, and they were important. They're important both in the United States and internationally. In, eight, in 1990, that little boy who had died of AIDS because he had gotten it from a blood transfusion from hemophilia after he died, a bipartisan act was passed in Congress called the Ryan White Care Act. And this is a bipartisan supported act that funds low-income clinics like the clinic in which I work, and this helps low-income patients get wraparound social work services and case management. In 2003, under President Bush, the program called the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief was uh, formed, and the PEPFAR program is also a one-stop model of care. PEPFAR has sites around the uh, globe and is responsible for about two thirds of the antiretroviral prescriptions that are available around the world are actually provided through the PEPFAR program. It's a profoundly important global program for HIV and it has been very influential. And it started with Eric Goosby shown here on the right, it started with people who knew about the one-stop model of care and the idea is to get all of your care in one place. In 2010, President Obama in the United States formed the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And in 2019, under uh, the Trump administration, the end the HIV epidemic was started. And this is our current strategy under President Biden, that the four pillars of the end the HIV epidemic, which are really mirrored around the world, are to diagnose new HIV infections, prevent new HIV infections, treat all HIV infections, and respond to outbreaks. And those four pillars are how we structure our work in HIV to try to end the HIV epidemic. Here in the United States, a lot of the epidemic has moved um, over to the south and southeast of this country. And that really has to do with poverty. There's a map of the United States with the red area showing poverty on the left. And on the right, that you can see that HIV is always a disease that follows social injustice, that follows incarceration, that follows poverty that follows interpersonal violence and all of that is playing out in the South. In fact, 52% of our new infections of HIV here in the United States are, are in the um, South and Southeast of this country. So I wanna tell you about Ward 86 for a minute because I think that our clinic really has modeled some of the clinical care programs and the clinical care paradigms that are occurring in HIV. We started uh, Ward 86 in January of 1983 and we also had an inpatient ward at the time because there were no antiretroviral therapies and people were unfortunately dying of these terrible opportunistic infections. By 1996, highly active antiretroviral therapies were established for HIV infection and people began to live longer and the morbidity and mortality from HIV for those who could afford and the countries that provided um, antiretroviral therapy plummeted after 1996. Our patients at Ward 86 are generally publicly insured. And the reason I wanna tell you about this is because when I tell you about long acting treatment later, I want us to remember that, that, that many of our populations in the US and many of our populations around the world are low income populations. There are high rates of poverty, but also addiction, about 35% in our clinic and marginal housing, a full one third of our patients are marginally housed. 
we started different programs at Ward 86 that really mirrored the advances in HIV therapy that occurred over the years. As I told you, 1996 was the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy. It was a profoundly important moment in HIV history. And after that, there became refinements to working on HIV care. For example, in, we started at Ward 86, a women's clinic in 2008, because women had often been left out of the discussion um, in, in places with specialized epidemics, like here in the US, where women, where there was more attention paid to men who had sex with men. In 2010, the, our city and the country eventually, and then the world turned towards universal antiretroviral therapy. Prior to 2013, the WHO had said that we should start antiretroviral therapy at certain T cell counts, at certain CD4 cell counts. By 2013, the world had changed to universal ART, start antiretroviral therapy the minute someone is diagnosed with HIV, because we know that chronic HIV has ongoing effects on inflammation, immune activation in individuals living with HIV. So starting therapy right away is beneficial. So we started in 2013 what's called a rapid ART program. This has now become a national and international model of care. The WHO has on their guidelines that we should start therapy as soon as possible after diagnosis um, to, uh, to get people's um, viral load to come down, CD4 count to stay up, and to help prevent what's called forward transmission. Because HIV, by this time, we knew that HIV treatment for someone living with HIV prevented HIV to individuals next to them. By 2012, the FDA had approved what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is those who are at risk of HIV, taking HIV medications, either oral or by an injectable, which we'll talk about, um, to prevent HIV. And we started a PrEP program in 2015. In 2016, we started a program for uh, Spanish-speaking individuals in the city of San Francisco. And then I think this is important to say that in 2017, we started a program for aging, for HIV and aging. And what do I mean by that? Well, people were living longer on the antiretroviral therapy. So I'm gonna tell you about the Golden Compass program and the pop-up program in the next slides. Just to tell you about the rapid ART program, again, at the beginning, we were using HIV therapies at certain T cell counts because they were so hard to take, but the therapies got better and better. They got easier and easier. And by 2006, we had our first one pill once a day combination regimen for HIV. That was a Fabrin's based regimen. And we, had, we now have multiple one pill once a day based regimens for antiretroviral therapy. In light of that, the world has turned towards, since it's easier to start HIV therapy, to maintain on HIV therapy, the world has gone towards rapidly starting HIV therapy. And again, this is internationally recommended. In terms of HIV and aging, we have seen, especially in places that have full antiretroviral access, which is about 75% of the planet at this point, um, we have seen that people are living longer, they're living normal lifespans, but because of the inflammation that can accompany HIV, people internally age a little faster when they're living with HIV. And so we want to work to keep people well, even when they're older. And the Golden Compass is one HIV and aging program model. There are four components of it. Um, the top one is heart and mind, that where we work on cardiology care and neurology care for people living with HIV. Um, we also work on geriatrics assessments for people living with HIV. We work on loneliness and we work on navigation. And the Golden Compass program has been modeled uh, many times around the world. There's other HIV and aging programs that we have modeled ourselves off of. And these are very important programs to help people living um, and thriving with HIV, even when they're older. The pop-up program is, um, is a program that we started in San Francisco. And this is also being, a, we modeled it after a program in Seattle, but there are many programs around the world which are working on those who are unstably housed living with HIV. This is a very special and important population. And um, for example, in the city of San Francisco, 75% of those who are living with HIV and have a house are virologically suppressed, but only 27% of those who are homeless are virologically suppressed. So we're working on ways to help people who are uh, have housing insecurity, and I'll talk about this when I get into treatment, um, get 
to the goal of HIV therapy, which is virologic suppression. And then finally, and I'll talk about this a little later in the talk, another important element of HIV care is beyond HIV treatment and prevention care, primary and preventative medical care for people living with HIV. We're starting to focus more on the heart. We're focusing on cardiovascular risk factors, on stroke risk factors, on mental health care, substance use care. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the reprieve study in a moment, very hot off the press um, in HIV care, a way to care for people with um, at control cardiovascular risk factors in the context of HIV. So I'm going to turn now to treatment and prevention. And I can't go over all of the HIV treatments in this short talk, and we definitely wanna to get to your questions. But what I'm gonna talk about right now is advances in HIV therapy. What are some novel advances that are happening in HIV therapy in 2023? And I think the biggest update that's happened in HIV treatment and prevention over the last two years are really the advent of long acting injectable medications to either treat or prevent HIV infection. So the thing is though we've had orally, uh, uh, orally available antiretroviral therapies now since 1996, and they've gotten easier and easier to take now one pill once a day combinations. It still can be very difficult for some individuals to take pills every day. When you have substance needs, when you have housing insecurity, when you have food insecurity, when there are other competing needs, this becomes a difficult problem to take medications every day. And so there's been a great deal of interest in, in, in developing injectable HIV medications for treatment. And there were three major trials that studied the first combination therapy that we now have to treat HIV infection. One is what's called an integrase inhibitor called cabotegravir. The second injectable is called ropivirine. And cabotegravir and ropivirine are available as long-acting injections uh, given separately. And, the th and this is the only um, long-acting injectable regimen that we have approved. And there were three major clinical trials that led to the development and marketing of these two um, long-acting injectable agents. One was called the FLARE trial, one was called the ATLAS trial, and one was called the ATLAS 2M trial. The ATLAS 2M trial studied the injectables being given every two months instead of every month, which is how FLARE and ATLAS were administered. Now, the important inclusion criteria of these trials is that everyone who participated in these clinical trials had to be on oral HIV medications. They had to have achieved the goal of therapy, which is virologic suppression. And then they got transferred over to the injectable medications. The one problem with that is what about people who have a hard time taking oral medications and getting virologic suppressed? Because when we think about ending the HIV epidemic, it is actually that population that has a hard time taking pills every day because of a variety of adherence reasons. It's that population that are probably gonna need the injectables the most. And if we look overall across the planet, in terms of overall adherence to antiretroviral therapy. Here in the US, there was a big study that was published last year that shows about 60% have really good adherence to HIV therapy. That means 40% do not. And across the world, this was a big study that was published in Lancet HIV in 2021, about 79% of people started on antiretroviral therapy across the world, get to virologic suppression after one year, but after three years, the virologic suppression rate is only 65%. So we're not where we need to be. We want to have higher virologic suppression rates. And what are some of those barriers to adherence? They totally depend on the region, the country, the population, but some of them are being mobile populations, depression, alcohol use, uh, other substance use, Stigma is a big reason that people can't take their HIV therapies home and show that to their families that they, they may have HIV or need to prevent HIV. Stockouts, transportation issues, there's a variety of reasons why people have a hard time taking oral ART every day. So we at Ward 86 wanted to start a new program. This is a demonstration project that we've now published where we tried the long-acting cabotegravir and ropivirine in patients 
who couldn't, who had adherence challenges, who couldn't take their oral therapy every day. And so even though we knew the inclusion criteria of the trials meant that you had to be virologically suppressed to take injectable treatment, we did try our therapies, these new therapies on patients without virologic suppression who at least expressed willingness to come to the clinic regularly every four to eight weeks to get their injections. We meet every two weeks to talk about each of the patients. We have a farm tech who helps us get the injectable medications. We have a protocol that's available publicly. Anyone can write me or get it from the San Francisco Getting to Zero website. And we have about two, now 220 patients who are on long-acting cabotegravir and lopivirine. We published this on July 4th, 2023 in the Annals of Internal Medicine that we showed at, out of our first 133 patients that we started on long-acting cabotegravir and lopivirine that 43% um, of them had started with viremia. They were not virologically suppressed. They couldn't take oral ART regularly for a variety of reasons. Actually, about two thirds of the patients in our program were homeless when we started injectables. We had them come in, we called them, we found them, and they came in about 73% of the time um, on time. Of those who started with, with virologic suppression, they all stayed virologically suppressed. But what about the population who started with viral loads that were high? We found that about 98% of the individuals who started with viremia, who had a hard taking time taking oral antiretroviral therapy, went to the goal of therapy, which was virologic suppression. We had a couple of virologic failures. We now know why they had some minor mutations to the um, regimens, to either rilpivirine or cabotegravir. And we've now refined our protocol and we now have 220 people on it doing well. So we're actually encouraging people to think about using it in patients with adherence challenges who say that they can come in regularly for injections. This is also the biggest update in HIV prevention. Since uh, 2012, we've had approved an oral pill called TDF-FTC, which is tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate and emtricitabine taken daily on an oral basis that we can use to prevent HIV. TDF-FTC is approved in both men who have sex with men, transgender women, and cisgender women. In men who have sex with men and transgender women, there are two other possibilities. One is PrEP with a cousin of TDF-FTC. It's called tenofovir alafenamide, amtricitabine, or TAF-FTC, and that can be taken daily in, in, in everything but not uh, vaginal sex, which it's not approved for. Um, and also there's on-demand PrEP with TDF FTC, meaning taking it right around the time of risk, but that's only approved in men who have sex with men and transgender women. But there were two big trials that led to the approval of long acting injectable every two months to prevent HIV. These trials were called the HBTN 083 and HBTN 084 studies. They were published in the New England Journal and Lancet respectively. And they looked across populations. HBTN 083 studied this in MSM and transgender women. HBTN 084 studied long acting PrEP in cisgender women. And the injectables were given every two months. It was cabotegravir alone. So that same medication that we had seen with treatment, now just one injectable called cabotegravir given every eight weeks as an injectable. And actually, long acting cabotegravir was superior to the daily oral pill with TDF-FTC. It was probably superior because you didn't have to take a pill every day. It's hard to be adherent to a pill every day, especially when you feel well. And essentially long acting cabotegravir has now been recommended by the World Health Organization as of a year ago for prevention worldwide. This is not being rolled out as quickly as we would have hoped. There's been some barriers to roll out, but um, the company has worked with uh, Medicine's patent pool to make these more affordable, and I'm hoping that long-acting cabotegravir will become a preventative option in many countries moving forward. And then I'm now going to end this talk with just a few comments about HIV vaccines and cure. These both remain elusive at this point. We do not have an HIV vaccine at this point. And actually um, there's been many it, um, attempts. In, uh, there was uh, just recently a huge vaccine trial that just failed 
um, which was um, called the Mosaico trial. And though we've tried for many years, it's been very difficult to formulate a vaccine to prevent HIV, partially because HIV attacks the very system that you would harness to, um, to fight the virus, which is the immune system. And we are very hopeful about a new mRNA vaccine. The mRNA vaccine technology was of course used for the first time for a major pathogen with COVID-19. And there is very high hopes for an mRNA vaccine. It worked very well in primates. And now there's been clinical trials that have just been launched for an mRNA HIV vaccine. In terms of cure, there have been now six people who are in either remission or cured of HIV. Now, unfortunately, uh, one has passed away, but um, the thing about a cure is that you have to do something very dramatic to cure HIV, at least in these six individuals to date. And what had happened is that all of these individuals had leukemia or lymphoma or required a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. And so the entire immune system was wiped out. And then the immune system transplant that was given back was given back with cells that do not have a co-receptor that help you take in HIV. CD4 is the main cell receptor that is the host cellular receptor to take in HIV, but there's a chemokine co-receptor called CCR5. And if you don't have CCR5 on your surface, which some um, of these matched uh, transplant individuals did not, then you cannot get HIV. And so these were hard to earn cures. Um, and though it has given people a lot of ideas and there's a major cure um, uh, research uh, platform going on right now with CRISPR technology, gene therapy technology, to think about the CCR5 receptor. There's also um, ways to try to flush HIV out of the system and then kill it with antiretroviral therapy called shock and kill. There are other cure strategies that are being advanced and being studied. And so I will actually end with one other major advance in HIV. Um, this was published in the New England Journal. There was a press release about it in April, and there was a paper about this in May of, um, I'm sorry, just in July of 2023. So this is very hot off the press, um, which is the reprieve study. The reprieve study was looking at giving individuals with HIV at low or moderate risk of HIV infection a statin to help prevent them from getting major cardiovascular events. I told you that everything's improving with HIV, the therapies work really well, but there's a chronic inflammation that occurs with HIV, even when you're on medication, that can predispose to cardiovascular events. And so what the reprieve trial showed us in a randomized study that if you give half of the people placebo, half of people living with HIV, a statin that you can bring down the rate of cardiovascular events. Um, and it actually decreased the primary outcome by 35%, which were major adverse cardiovascular events. So this is likely to change treatment guidelines. This is very new information, but we're likely to be pushing the use of statins in people living with HIV much more quickly to prevent some of those chronic illnesses that can occur with a chronic infection. So I'd like to end there and take your questions in the remaining 15 minutes. Thank you so much for staying with me with this overview of history, HIV history, epidemiology, treatment, prevention, vaccines, and care. Thank you so much, Doctor, for that very insightful session. And it was really, truly educational and informative. I was quite an eye opening seeing the statistical of uh, you know the statistical prevalence of HIV all around the world, especially the United States. And you have clearly mentioned, and uh, one of my doubt, major doubt, was also cleared in that. Uh, so uh, for the next part, I would like to hand over the mic to our moderator, Madhuri. Thank you so much, Dr. for this wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone. And welcome to Discussions with Global Leaders. My name is Mazri, and we're excited to be speaking with Dr. Monica Gandhi, a physician and professor who teaches medicine at the University of California, and is currently the director of the UCSF Gladstone Center. We've had a lot of questions regarding your topic today, and we hope we can answer them all in time as well. Um, for the first question, I'm going to be passing the Mike, back to the top. Thank you, Madhuri. 
So, doctor, my question to you was, uh, with the emergence of new variants, how has HIV research adapted to address the potential challenges to treatment and prevention strategies? The implementation challenges, was that the question? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's a really good question because UNAIDS, when they put out their major update in July of 2023, and they put out an update every July in advance of the International AIDS meeting, they said that we actually have the tools to treat and prevent HIV. We have excellent antiretrovirals. We have excellent preventative agents. What we don't have, unfortunately, is the political will across the planet to treat everyone living with HIV. Because if we treated everyone living with HIV, that brings the viral load down to undetectable. Undetectable does equal untransmittable. That's one thing that the WHO put out a very big message in July of uh, 2023 at the International AIDS meeting in Australia, is they reinforce the message that if you're on therapy, if your viral load is undetectable, you cannot pass it on. And they actually put a cutoff of viral load less than a thousand copies per mil and not being able to pass on the virus. So if that happens, um, if we could get everyone in the world treated, we could probably stop the virus and everyone else prevention. But the problem is we don't have that full political will. The PEPFAR program, which is funded mainly, which is really funded in the U.S., um, it's it's um under threat at the moment in Congress, even though it's been a highly successful bipartisan effort up to this point. The WHO is also fading, facing funding cuts um, coming off the COVID-19 pandemic. UNAIDS is facing funding cuts. So we need really a global, um, I think, political will. It, it takes about $22 billion a year to give everyone who needs treatment and everyone who needs prevention, treatment and prevention. That is not that much money when you compare it against 39 million people living with HIV and all that they're going through and their families. Thank you so much, Dr. for the wonderful answer. It was really insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for answering our amazing question. And for our next question, I'm going to be passing the mic to Dr. Yang. Yes. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. It truly highlighted the importance of the field and really uh, a lot of the misconceptions uh, and sadly the negative stigma as well. Mm -hmm. um, in the realm of vaccination research and aspects to that effect, obviously we've seen a lot of advances of that with the COVID vaccine getting over the recent pandemic that we've had. Would you be able to comment on any promising developments um, that are hopefully uh, hopefully in development uh, in pursuit of an effective HIV vaccine, if at all? And if so, how close are we yet to achieving it? Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question because what I just told you, the treatment and prevention could end the HIV epidemic. But fundamentally, it hasn't. And a lot of that has to do with political will and, and paying for the prevention, paying for the treatments. And absolutely, having a highly effective vaccine um, has always been the holy grail of HIV medicine. It's the, it's the holy grail of TB. It's the holy grail of malaria, dengue, chikungunya, vaccines work. Um, we have not been able to get a highly a successful HIV vaccine, not even a 30% uh, successful HIV vaccine like we have for tuberculosis or malaria, which aren't great, but at least they do something. Um, and that, it really has to do with the nature of the virus. The virus not only attacks the immune system, but the RNA of the virus, which it starts as, as an RNA virus, converts into DNA inside the host cell through a process called reverse transcription, and that DNA intercalates into the host cell chromosome. So it's extremely difficult to oust the virus. Um, it, it really can stay with you. It's why cure has been very difficult. So as I said at the very end, I think mRNA HIV vaccines are still hopeful. There was an mRNA HIV vaccine candidate start, um, tried in macaques and they gave the macaques rectal challenges, gave them the vaccine before that, and there was prevention of HIV. So there are some human trials ongoing. It's the closest thing that we have to hope, but it's been 
quite difficult to get to an HIV vaccine. And it, it's one of our, we've had such advances in HIV medicine, but not in the vaccine world. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And that was really interesting to hear about the whole take on vaccines and how it is. For our next question, we'll be passing the mic to Muskan. Uh, first of all, Dr. Gandhi, I want to thank you. Uh, that was absolutely, absolutely amazing. Like from the old, like from the history to the bad, like the history, where we've come, where we are and what's our future. That was, I learned a lot more than I would in my med school classes and that says a lot. <laughs> But uh, my question to you is, so I'm actually very much interested in the long-term implications of COVID-19. And uh, I've actually read tons of studies which basically talked about uh, how COVID-19 is marked by T-cell apoptosis. As in, there is like an absolute decrease in the number of CD4 positive and CD8 positive T-cells in COVID infection. It has been recorded in multiple studies. So considering this nature, considering... Uh, these findings, along with the characteristics of HIV infection that we know it does reduce the number of CD4 positive T cells, uh, and the enduring consequences of COVID-19 that we currently know of, do you anticipate any resemblance between the two, and uh, or if there is any distinction between the two in the nature of both of these diseases? Because we do know the nature of HIV, right? But we don't know what are the long-term implications of COVID-19? So do you, considering the, their similarity, do you consider or think that, what, what is your opinion on uh, the nature of long-term diseases in both? I hope I hope I was able to explain. Yeah, no, it's, a, it, it's actually a really good question. And it's true that we don't know as much about COVID as we do about HIV because HIV we've had around for 40 years. On the other hand, we have had six other coronaviruses that infect humans. We have four common cold coronaviruses. Um, and we have we had SARS in 2002, which was an epidemic, and we had MERS in 2011. And this is the third time that we know of SARS-CoV-2 where coronaviruses cause severe disease. Now, coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They are not RNA to DNA viruses, which are retroviruses retroviruses absolutely stay in the body. There's no way to get rid of them unless again in those six individuals who had a, a bone marrow transplant where you wipe out their whole immune system. We have not been able to cure HIV. Coronaviruses are thankfully very different. RNA viruses like coronavirus, at least the six others have never stayed in the body before and kept on replicating. So I do not think that coronaviruses are like HIV. Retroviruses are much more serious. Retroviruses are need lifelong treatment with antiretrovirals, whereas coronaviruses don't. I do think that coronaviruses transiently do decrease T cells, CD8 and CD4 cells, but it's a transient effect. And that is actually true of all severe illnesses. We've now really learned through looking at post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 and long COVID that all acute illnesses will temporarily decrease your immune system. Luckily, it will come back up. And there can be lingering symptoms after any severe illness, severe influenza, severe COVID, severe um, sepsis. And so I think a lot of the work that we're doing on long COVID, and they've just launched uh, clinical trials in the United States through, through the recovery trial program of trying different treatments are going to help any post-acute syndrome for any infection where you get a severe infection and you get symptoms after that. Metformin right now is kind of the only thing that looked like it really helped long COVID um, because it's it, mainly through its anti-inflammatory effects. And so metformin will also be studied in a randomized way, um, along with the way that it's already been studied in the COVID out trial. So I think we have a lot of hope for people of post-acute sequelae, but I do not think it is the same as HIV. I think HIV stays in the body and it's much more serious that way. I think that was definitely very reassuring to hear because I have seen like a lot of discourse online about how yeah. due to the reduction in the CD4 positive T cells after COVID infection, it can result and we don't know the effects we're going to have in 10 years down the line. Uh, it really seems transient. I really seem transit. I will tell you that there are a lot of other papers in COVID-19 showing the affected response after an infection that you get strong development of T cell memory, of CD4 cell memory. It's not peripherally circulating. It's in your lymph nodes and your thymus in, in places that keep T cell memory. And there are many papers on that. 
that's definitely very reassuring to hear. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you so much, Doctor. That was a wonderful answer. And I was really interested in hearing more on city for self and how the whole apoptosis can occur. And I would definitely read more about it. For our next question, I will be asking. So we've been hearing a lot on the HIV research, vaccines, and so much more. But what do you believe is some of the key roadblocks to transition research in the field of HIV itself? It's a great question. I think actually one of the major roadblocks are what are called implementation science research. How do we get all these advances into the hands of everyone? Because again, we have long acting. I told you about long acting being the biggest advance in HIV therapy. Long acting therapy has still not been approved by the World Health Organization for populations worldwide. If you're talking about stigma, how useful would it be? I'm going to talk about specifically India because I um, have done HIV work in India. It is very difficult for a daughter-in-law who got infected from her husband to go home with an HIV medication bottle. Not because her husband, the son of the family, didn't give her HIV, but because the mother-in-law will blame her for giving her son HIV, which was exactly the opposite. Stigma is a huge problem in India, in, in many places around the world, in taking HIV therapies, having that bottle and those pills every day. So being able to get an injectable every two months in a mobile clinic where you go very discreetly, get your injectable and then go home, either for prevention and treatment would be an enormous advance. And we do not have, what, what we need is what's called implementation science research. We need more research as how to implement HIV advances we already know what works. How do we get them to the people who need it? We do need political will. What we need is drug companies to work with the medicines patent pool to make these medications more affordable worldwide. Uh, uh, we need, there's going to be a new HIV medication called lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is a once every six months injection that can be used with treatment. Could we put lenacapavir with cavitegravir and give that out worldwide? Because that'd be easier. One would be every six months, one would be every two months. And there's a lot of resistance to ropivirine. So would lenacapavir and cavitegravir be, be something that we could give out worldwide? We need political will to do that because we have both those treatments available now. Lenacapavir is being studied for prevention. We don't know yet, but there's two major trials going on called the Purpose 1 and Purpose 2 trials. Lenacapavir every six months, an injectable every six months that would prevent HIV. If that works, and we'll get the results of those trials in maybe one and a half years, if it works, we need lenacapavir for everyone who needs it. How do we get the political will to do that? So a lot of what's going on in HIV is that stigma, is that political will, is that people getting tired of it. Isn't that over? We're seeing that happening with COVID, right? Like people just say it's over. COVID will never be over. COVID is definitely out of its pandemic phase in the endemic phase, but we're always going to need to work on COVID. We always need to work on HIV and we need that political will and that scientific, all of you on this call to, to, to bring your best efforts to try to work on implementing what we already know works and getting the long acting therapies worldwide out disseminated. Thank you so much, Doctor. And, you know, I definitely agree. These are some of the things we have been hearing about a lot. And I think these are one of the few major roadblocks that we'll see. And we hopefully can, you know, adjust, go around it, learn to go help out from it as well. So thank you so much. For our next question, I will be passing the mic to Harshan. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for this uh, insightful session. So I want to ask that in the context of HIV update 2023, uh, what's the most significant recent development that you believe has the potential to make a substantial impact on the landscape of HIV treatment prevention or we can say cure? I think the most significant event of the ones I mentioned is really long-acting capitagraver for prevention. I, if uh, you were going to ask me to rank them, <laughs> I would give that first. Because the thing about prevention is we've had biomedical prevention since 2012. Before that, prevention was behavior, was condom use, abstinence, um, monogamy, ABCD, it was called. 
um, and abstinence, be faithful, condom use. And the problem with that is behavior is hard to change. Sometimes your behavior is not the behavior of your sexual partner. So we needed biomedical advances. We needed a pill, a cream, a shot. We needed something that you could buy, like biomedical advances like COVID vaccine. You need a, a biomedical strategy to prevent HIV. So we got oral pills. But the oral pills, taking a pill every day when you feel absolutely fine is hard to do. And we have seen that adherence is difficult uh, with oral prep and and availability and access and some countries have not committed to take uh, to giving out prep to their populations. So I think the biggest advance is the idea of getting a long acting preventative agent where you give it once every two months. If lenocapivir work, works once every six months, that I think is going to make a huge difference in curbing new HIV infections. If we're at 1.3 million new HIV infections as of last year, the epidemic is not going to end with those kind of numbers. Thank you, Doctor, for answering that question. And I think we will definitely learn more. And I think we'll be able to understand it as well. So thank you. And we've unfortunately come to our last question for today. And I'm going to be passing the mic to Ellen. Hi, Doctor. It was amazing listening to your presentation today. And uh, basically, I'd like to echo what Ms. Khan said earlier, and I think I speak for everyone to say that we thoroughly enjoyed your presentation from the very beginning. Thank you so Thank much you. for such a wonderful presentation. As for my question, it's going to deviate a little from what the norm was so far, but we'd love to hear your answer on this. For our more junior attendees just getting into research and medicine, what inspired you to pursue the field you're currently in? And how has this choice impacted your life? Has it been everything that you had initially anticipated? Well, it's a it's such a good question. You know, um, I'm very interested in social justice, and uh, I got interested in social justice for two reasons. One was um, I grew up in a very conservative state in in the country of the United States, and. Um, I was Indian American and um, actually it was very difficult. Um, there was kind of a stigmatization of, of, at least when I was growing up, I felt of, of just being of color. And then the second was that I would go to India growing up to see my family and I couldn't believe the disparity between rich and poor, that, that we would have medications for diseases in the United States and people would die of something that they didn't have to die of in poor communities. And so, um, for me, I think all of medicine is a fight against the disparities between rich and poor. I actually think it's the entire field of medicine is that, but infectious disease for me illustrates that even more because we have such simple advances, vaccines and therapeutics for infectious diseases. Very few people should be really getting very sick of infectious diseases, unlike, unfortunately, cancer or autoimmune diseases. We have excellent antibiotics, therapies for infectious diseases and vaccines, and yet we have infectious disease still raging. I mean, glo uh, globally, the three major causes of infectious disease death are tuberculosis, HIV, and then malaria. All of them have treatments and prevention. And um, antimicrobial resistance is the fourth. And so because of that, I think it's a, it's a place of social justice where you can really fight and do good in, in the context of also learning about the science, which I think is also fascinating. The other reason I like infectious disease is it's always the other. If you get a bacteria, it's the other. I can find an antibiotic or a vaccine to fight it. It's not myself hurting myself, it's something other. And, you, and it's very optimistic to be in infectious diseases. So that's what inspired me. And yes, it's been everything I thought and I like it very much. Thank you so much, Doctor, and we're really happy to have you here today. We enjoyed your presentation, and we definitely hope to learn more from you as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure to talk with all of you. Thank you. So for all our audience members here today, please continue to follow us on Metrospe, and please do look out for our upcoming events as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you for having, oh, thank you for having me. That was really fun. And I hope it gets, I'll definitely share the YouTube.